Blog Talk Radio. Stevie B's Media Production is a part of the Shellcaster Network. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by members of the Churches of Christ. With your host, Stevie R. Butler. You're listening to What a Word from the Lord Radio Show. You are my protector and you are my provider and my deliverer. There's no other help I know. You are my protector and you are my provider and my deliverer. Listening to What a Word from the Lord Radio Show. Good evening, wherever you are in the world listening to this radio broadcast. Stevie B's Media Production presents What a Word from the Lord Radio Show. I'm your host this evening, Stevie R. Butler. And this radio show is being broadcast from Stevie B Media Production at the Carolina Studio in the great state of North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just grateful for the privilege to be to bring you a program. 
where we as Christians and members of the Churches of Christ can share our faith and preach and teach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ on a weekly basis. If you'd like to contact us while we're on the air this evening, just give us a call to the live show at 713-955-0508, or you can go to the Blog Talk Radio website, and you'll find this show live tonight on that website on page 2 of that website. There are over 1,500 live shows on that website, and you will find this show consistently now on pages 1 through 4 of that website. What a blessing. If you have any questions or comments for any of my co-hosts or special guests on these programs, you can send your emails to my new email address, butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com, or you can call Stevie B. Media Production at the Carolina Studio at 910-491-6400. Zero five. Now, again, this program is brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. And if you need any assistance in locating a congregation in your area, please feel free to contact us. Now, folks, on tonight's show, we have a special edition with my co-host, Kelly Fletcher. She serves with the Livingstone Church of Christ there in Indianapolis, Indiana. So, Kelly, we're going to turn it over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Brother Stevie. Hello, and welcome to those in our listening audience. I appreciate you tuning in tonight. My name is Kelly Fletcher, and I am your co-host for this evening. This evening's show will be a little bit different because I will be a part of the listening audience instead of a part of the discussion. Uh, Tonight's topic is a conversation between brothers. It's a conversation, conversation by men for men, young and older. If you have any questions for our guest tonight, please email us at butlersteve1009 at yahoo.com or send me an instant message on Facebook. So without anything further, I will ask Brother Hubbard to please introduce himself, and then Brother Goins can introduce himself, and they can take it away. Well, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate the invitation to share with you on this evening. I'm Brother Stanley Hubbard of the Tuesday Terrace. Church of Christ in Indianapolis here in Indiana, and we uh, thank God for the chance to be with you on today. Uh, we do, my wife and, my, and I are both authors. We've done workshops uh, later around the world on several material areas. And we're excited about this chance to talk on this evening about uh, men and men issues to help us to better understand how to serve each other and to bless each other. And so we look excited to an opportunity for this conversation to take place. I'm blessed to have with me also today, with Marty Goins. Marty, how are you doing this evening? I'm very well, and I am also very uh, humbled and very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, Brother Hubbard, again, I'm Marty Goins. I'm also a member of the Kingsley Terrace Church of Christ here in Indianapolis. I've been a member of the body. Uh, God blessed me with that opportunity to join this body uh, over 50 years ago, and I'm very excited to uh, continue my journey. I've uh, found my space in the uh, service of the Lord as in uh, I have a foundation, uh, I found it called Eternal Now Ministries, and you can find that at eternalnowministries.org. And um, through that ministry, I do a morning text messaging service where we reach anywhere from, I personally reach out to pretty close to four or 500 people every morning, and uh, I call it the Ministry of Inspiration. I uh, believe in uh, edifying and uh, admonishing uh, the fruits of the Spirit and all those things that come along with that. And I recently published my first book, which is called The Eternal Now, A Moment That Never Ends. And you can find that on Amazon.com. And it's in that book I basically share my story, my journey, uh, beginning when I was like uh, six years old, looking up into the sky, and I think I had my first spiritual awakening. So I'm happy to be here. Looking forward to this discussion with my brother, who is also my mentor and a very good friend and brother Hubbard. Well, bless you. Bless you, Marty. Appreciate that. We do several workshops that you alluded to around the country from everything from singles to parenting to blended families to grief to uh, marriage. So there's an opportunity for many things to expand and grow together. I do want to begin in our conversation addressing some things. There were some some questions that did come in. I want to, us to begin, Marty, if we could, to uh, kind of uh, begin to address some of the ones. One of the first ones was actually asked was, um, in, in single parent households specifically, that, that mo- for mothers who have sons, there seems to be a need for mentoring, a need for mentoring a big brother in the son's life. 
And the question is, what can men or the brothers do to help encourage and provide a good example of a male figure in their lives? And that's the first question that we, we have, Marty. I know we want to address that first. I, I, I do want to consider, as I think you allude to, the need for 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 male figures. Research was done among uh, elephants that identified that when they reached a certain age, the testosterone began to increase and it began to feel stronger and become very aggressive. They discovered that uh, elephants were in the process of killing anything. They could kill, killing each other because uh, because there was something about their this this change in their body that made them very aggressive. But they learned when they were elder, older elephants around them who were bigger than them and stronger than them, they would calm down and respond to that relationship. And I think it it lays the foundation for this question, um, Marty, the sense of the need for for men to mentor boys and um, the importance of that example. How would you respond to that concern, Marty? Well, you know, thank you, Brother Hubbard. First of all, uh, ironically, or not till I say ironically, I actually have a lot of experience in that area because I was raised by a single uh, parent, which was my mom. And I had an older brother and a younger sister. Being in the middle, you know, that meant I was perfect for everything, from washing dishes to cooking and those type of things. Then, uh, if I look back now, um, my mother came from a very large family, and uh, she had five uh, brothers and four sisters, she being close to the bottom. So she, there was a lot of examples of uh, men who were upright. Um, they were uh, service men. Uh, my, brother's, uh, my mother's oldest brother was a police officer, one of the first black police detectives in the Indianapolis Police Department. Uh, her brother right next to her, there's only two surviving siblings. He's 90 and my mom is 89. But I mentioned that because they were the – uh, examples that I needed to uh, have in my life from an early age. Uh, we lived with my grandfather. Lived with my grandfather. Oh, my father provided that role model for us. Okay, heard a little feedback. Uh, provided oh, role models for myself that allowed me to see what it meant to be a man. Uh, and my mother being uh, also pretty much raised by men uh, in her family, as well as my grandfather, knew the kind of things that I needed. And one of the first things she instilled upon us was to have that relationship and understanding uh, uh, with God. And I think that was the really the basis and foundation for uh, understanding how important it was to uh, learn how to be a man by the instructions and wisdom that was given down to us by God, and that those things were translated first to my brother, who was uh, three or four years older than I am, and so he served as a mentor. And as I grew older, being a very curious young man, I was able to uh, uh, pick the brains and listen to uh, uh, sit like at the feet of older men in my family, and then it it it, it, it kind of expanded to neighbors and um, just a lot of people around me, a lot of men. But my mom more or less, uh, you know, orchestrated that whole relationship by her being my primary parent. She didn't uh, baby us. Uh, she insisted that we had three rules. Put God first. You could do anything you want and uh, get yourself out of bed and get busy. That was her That was her motto. So that was my experience oh, growing up. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let, me, let me interject also this consideration that uh, I, I believe that, it, that there are wonderful mothers out there who are great women who love their children, as you alluded to your mother. Uh, I, unlike you, I had my, I, my biological father was there. He upgraded us. But let me say this. I, I, I've come to believe that it, it really takes a man to raise a man and takes a woman to raise a woman. I'm not advocating that a mother can't be a great mother, can't serve and bless her children, but women don't think like men, and men don't think like women. I think Absolutely. that's what's important to understand when you talk about this idea of the need for mentoring. It is important that a mother find a way to make sure her son 
is in the presence of men who can teach him how to be a man. Like elephants need to be around male elephants and lions need to be around lions to learn the dynamics of how to function. But that that's part of the dynamic I think that we're discussing. You cannot, and so that means a, a mother has to be uh, willing to understand men and women don't think alike. And I don't care how how much a man loves his daughter. I don't care how much a woman loves her son. She, a woman doesn't think like a man. A man does not think like a woman. For the reason, Absolutely. I think it boils back to the fact that there's a need for for mothers to make sure that sons are in the presence of not any man, but of of healthy minded men. And a mother can't you can't pick your children's friends, but you can pick where your children find their friends. So you right. know, and then mother must don't make it a habit of letting your children grow with no direction, no guidance, uh, uh, and making sure that people who they can see who have a vision in their lives. Don't allow just anybody to talk to your kids or be around your children. Uh, if there's a man you have access to, but he's not spiritual-minded or serious-minded man, your sons, boys are going to learn from the males that they see. And you can't, mm-hmm. you can't necessarily, you can, but there are men who are willing to give energy and time. I've emphasized even to our sisters of the congregation, when our men are meeting, when the men are going bowling, men are having classes, your son may say, I don't want to hang out with those guys. Your son needs to be around healthy, serious-minded men, and, and he needs that to learn how to think and function like a man, or he'll pick up a copy and the pattern of habits of boys in school with him or some negative character as an illustration of what to be. So I think in the question, Marty, was the asking about the idea of having a mentor, the essentiality of having men, having someone in their lives, and the question is, what can those men do to provide a good example? And I think a man who's setting good principles for himself, watch a person. Don't just say, because he's male, my son should be around him. Every male is not equal. Make sure there are men who are thinking and functioning in a healthy way, and you're choosing to, to, to identify that. And whether it be to ask, to some context, I, I'm not saying turn your child over to any guy who looks like he's got it together, because he may not. But I'm saying that at least creating that opportunity so someone who seems to be solid and have the illustration to ask them if they're taking them out to breakfast every now and then. There are men who are willing to do that. Now, they, we should be looking for that opportunity, but we don't. It's important that someone at least, uh, that you're asking someone to take serious thought to how they can be part of that, uh, of that conversation. I think, uh, and I, I couldn't agree more, but to your point, uh, I guess uh, what I would say is that uh, I know that every uh, – Young men or children don't always grow up in the same environment. Environment has a lot to do with it, okay, because uh, there are people who uh, grew up with single mothers, for example, who have had bad experiences in their life with the men of their life. Uh, I was very blessed to not have that situation as much as I had a situation of men around me who, like you said to your point, was that they were there as a living, walking example of how a man should carry himself, how he should treat his family, responsibility. And so just by mere exposure, I was already being mentored uh, in terms of like Mm -hmm. uh, instruction, you know, and that mother's role when with the question saying about single households, specifically about mothers, I guess I just wanted to emphasize that the mother has a role in exactly mm-hmm. what you're saying, is making sure that uh, the son is exposed to those type of influence. And I'm very fortunate to have that in, uh, around in my life. And then there's a responsibility falls on the individual. I never like to underestimate a person's willingness or desire to want to be a strong person, uh, male or female. But in the case of a man uh, or as a young boy, if you don't have people around you who also are interested in mentoring you, then that can become problematic in the long run because, again, you'll, if, if, if they're not there, or uh, you and you have to look for them on your own, you know, volition, then you will uh, invariably run the risk of, of getting with the wrong people. So it's important that the mother or father or both not only uh, provide the guidance in that, but that there be those people available to you. In my opinion, yeah, but I think I agree with you on the essentialness of having people who are committed to setting the example and willing to spend their time with the son. A second question we see, Marty, was this one. How can they be 
uh, was asking about the idea of uh, men involved in, in church environments and those kinds of things and being engaged with spiritual environment. The question was, there's a concern regarding more men not attending or active in the church. How men have men ever shared their reasons for not attending or being active? I will begin, uh, Marty, by responding to this by identifying some distinctions that we have to understand how, in some ways, we have feminized Christianity to the point that men don't see it as a manly kind of thing. Even the definition of man has been twisted mm-hmm. by the world that we live in. Uh, there was a book uh, mm-hmm. called Why Men Don't Go to Church. It really talked about this whole part of this whole dynamic. The thing is this: when we've had at Kingsley Terrace, we've had had uh, we've had old school, new school competitions, right? Whether with volleyball for the sisters, basketball for the men, or a combination of both. And in and, and those situations, we have those events. We notice so many more males show up for active events. But when you look in the Bible, in the first century, you mainly have man after man after man. Paul with Timothy, with Titus, and with Epaphroditus, Trophimus, all these different men are actively seen in Scripture. But you notice the distinction when you talk about men being active. Men, men, men do what they're good at. Uh, when I say we have some ways almost feminized Christianity, we made it almost a situation where you're at your best when you sit in a class and you learn. You emphasize an environment of education and learning. Uh, men, too, to do, men tend to do things that they are good at. So some men don't feel comfortable reading or comfortable in an environment because they do their well in school. It's not something they do a lot of in reading inside their lives, period. And so in a congregation environment, it has an emphasis upon the capacity to read and to, and, to, and to comprehend your reading. A man can begin to feel like he doesn't fit in. Also, so the key is how was the reason men don't find that connection? A man has to feel valuable and important in the place where he finds himself. Men need God, but men need men. It is it is the places where you find strong, healthy minded men bonding together, where men are attracted to strong other men who seek and achieve something of power. But sometimes in congregational environments when the emphasis is on one or two people or a brother, you know, you can never do anything and are seeing that the greatest thing you can do is to usher at the door and there's no more of an opportunity to grow or to expand as a man in that environment. You find a place that men can feel shut down and disengaged and not feel a need to be connected to a spiritual environment, which means part of the battle sometimes comes from leadership, leadership seeing the significance of every man finding his place that, the same brother shouldn't lead prayer all the time. The same one shouldn't be up in some kind of capacity. There should be always be an opportunity to expand and to grow. In my own background of bringing, of bringing inside of the church, uh, my dad even preached later in life. My dad never knew his father, but, but he was able, to, was able to be what he didn't have. But I noticed early for many years in my Southeast Texas experiences, we had these training classes for men. And what were they? We got together every Sunday evening and went over the acts of worship and how to function inside a worship environment. And that was our education for being a man's class, women's class that were relationships and things that were essential. So we, we created an environment that the only thing that makes church, the only thing that makes the church become that where men have value is when they can pass the communion trail, when they can get up there and, and they can say about the, about the communion or lead a prayer, lead a song. We come together in worship to worship God, but that's house chores. The work begins when you leave. So we have to create an environment where men find power, sharing the so finding identity in a relationship with God is based on the importance of those in leadership seeking to not be territorial, but seeking to share the power and share the responsibility. Iron sharpens iron, but it's often connected to, and then men find their identity based on their environment, whereas women find it based on relationships. So it's important to help men find a place and being involved and engaged. And when they're sitting on the back seat somewhere, listening to a lesson, and that's all that they're doing, they're not engaged, they're not involved, and therefore many begin to wonder, I'm not just going to sit up here every week. And because of a loss of connection with God, without, without godly men teaching and training them, they find themselves making decisions all based on themselves. That's my perspective of it, Marty. What's your idea? Well, I think uh, I not only agree with that, but I think there's another level that has to be considered uh, also. I was uh, just doing a little study earlier. Uh, I was reminded of uh, Hebrews in 10.25 where it talks about not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, but so much the more as we see the day approaching and exhorting one another. 
okay? And I think that one of the problems that I've seen and have experienced with a lot of young men and women, but particularly with men, is not understanding what we mean by church and what we mean by attending the assembly. Uh, they seem to conflate those two things. The one, the church is a place where you just go and you sit and listen, be talked to, or preach that, and then put your money in the basket and leave. Or you know, they don't see the the connection between uh, uh, assembling yourself together. So when I speak of church in a, in regard to an individual about uh, whether they show up at the building or not, it's a little bit different, but not totally from what the church, as we understand it, is being the body of Christ. But in that regard, uh, most men that I've encountered uh, who find, you know, that church is not something that they feel like they have to do, uh, the biggest issue is they don't understand uh, what the benefit and the purpose behind it. One of it, obviously, is to strengthen our bond, uh, to be able to connect with one another. You mentioned about having different activities where we uh, admonish and edify and encourage one another. And they don't see this as a place for that because, uh, just quite frankly, the world uh, has been um, just uh, very, very, very proficient at trying to destroy the whole image of getting up and going to the assembly. When we were growing up, it was nothing. No one forced. I, people say, well, I was made to go to church. I, I don't recall that. And I only can only speak from my own experience in this regard. Church was a place where uh, we wanted to go. I mean, we were there practically every day. And it was because all the things that we found interesting young were the things that we were attracted to. They had sports. They had activities. Uh, Jesus was there food, all the things, in the, you know, I'm growing, talking about growing up in the 50s and the 60s, uh, particularly in the 50s, uh, there weren't rec centers and games and things like that. And I think it starts at a very young age and what our perception of what we mean by to assemble ourselves together. So I think that what we need to do as uh, uh, members of the body and people who understand how the scriptures are divided is to make sure that a man understands that his value is bringing his experience, bringing his opportunity to share his his problems, receiving solutions, and that's where I think he began to realize that it's one thing to go to church, just worship and teaching, but it's another thing to understanding the benefit of being in an assembly. Um, I, I often, when I'm in church, my, my most edifying time is uh, before and after the service. Because you know yourself, brother, Hubbard, I'm all over the place talking to individuals, men and women. And most people don't see assembly of church as being that fellowship that also protects us. Uh, I know we've heard of the example of when a, a lion, you know, Satan uh, told he would walk to, like a lion to look and see who he can devour, devour. Well, many of us heard the scenario and understand that when a lion is hunting a pack, he doesn't attack the herd where all the stable. He tries to get that one that's lagging by himself. And so when you're a person who's not uh, understanding the benefit of staying close with other uh, like-minded individuals, you, you allow yourself to become vulnerable. So I think those, those kind of points need to be uh, further emphasized by those of us that are there and those who, uh, 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 and, you know, who want to help people to increase it is to teach them the value of going is not just personal for their own edification, but for also the edification of others. That's the real value of assembly along with worshiping God. I appreciate it more. And I think as you're alluding to also, just this, this disconnect societally, we're a very pluralistic society where people don't really focus on connecting. We have false connections with social media, with Facebook and Instagram and and TikTok and all this stuff. This is really a fake relationship because you're 3,000 friends you've never met. And I think this the idea which about the Bible is so clear, part of what worship is, Acts 2, is continue steadfast in the fellowship. Fellowship is sharing together and sharing with. It's the idea of sharing in our commitment, our drive together, our work together. And when, when worship becomes something we just pop in and do and not a relationship with God, not a relationship with each other, it's something we do. We lose the context that they had in the first century. First Corinthians 5 talks about withdrawing fellowship, but how can we withdraw fellowship that you don't even have? And we live in a world now where we pop in and out and have no dis no response no no connection no no responsibility no anticipation of each other and that's very unhealthy for any kind of family. If your children can come and go and you want to come and go, you want to want to eat seven eight nine years of age, then they'll be all messed up. There has to be some sense of structure, 
and a sense of responsibility and accountability for the relationship that exists. And that has been happening for men, and I think it's alluded to, when men understand the significance of iron sharpening iron, I mean, it's, it's a blessing. It is a blessing for men to spend time with men. But many, uh, many men don't have men friends. They're positive, the ones that they can say they really do something of significance with. And part of the strength that comes is men being connected together and bonding with each other, which is a very important core biblical principle. You know, when you uh, – we had a study a long time ago, and I, I learned this uh, with you, Brother Hubbard, of studying the word religion and its origin. And I have be, I've since then taken a really deep dive with that and uh, began to look at uh, uh, the word religion. You hear one of the most popular sayings you hear right now is, I'm spiritual but not religious. Okay, that's like saying I drive a Civic, but I don't have a Honda. Okay, it's like those are the same thing. And what people don't understand, and I'm going to say this, this has become my understanding. What I see it happen is, is that, you know, the world, again, through its various channels of manipulation, uh, and, and I believe that Satan plays a hand in this, is to confuse individuals about what we mean by religion and church and how that associates. Uh, the history and study I've done, and I'm, I always stand to be enlightened, but what I begin to understand as I went further back that the word religion in itself was not originally a theological concept. It really talked about if you break down the idea of re, which means to return, and uh, I think it's Ligari, I may not pronounce it right, which means to align oneself or connect. And so uh, what I learned was, was that originally, and this without going too far, we don't have a lot of time, but the main thing was is that people back earlier in the days were very tribal. And so a lot of times we had to begin to align ourselves with other people of like-mindedness. But over the years through folklore and the apology and different things, uh, this became synonymous with uh, theological belief because back in those days, and I say thousands of years ago, if I aligned myself with another group of individuals, it was a matter of survival. So I had to give some authority to that alliance and thus I attribute it to God, which if you can also see how that as people begin to align themselves and became kings, they wanted to give themselves authority with that alliance and saying, well, God put me here. And so I can easily see how that became conflated with the idea of why, you know, religion and going to church is something I don't have to do as long as I'm spiritual. I don't know if that makes sense, but I can see how today the average person who is not studied, who doesn't understand, you know, they say the trouble with words is language because, they, you know, they have so many different uh, uh, applications. I think it's important that we emphasize to young people in particular that we are, that religion is not something that that is counter to understanding our relationship with God, but it by mere definition and concept means to align oneself. And this is what we do when we assemble. We realign ourselves with those people bonded by a similar faith and idea. I appreciate it, Martin. I think as you alluded to that, that bond and connection with God and with each other is key. But the next question we gave, that we were given was this one here. Some men have walked away from their families. What will it take to get them back? Uh, that's the question. Some have walked away from their mm-hmm. families, and the question is, what will it take uh, to get men to come back? But, but let me just again project uh, in contemplation of this question uh, a few things I want to add. The first one is that it's important to understand that men do what makes sense to men, and men do not do what makes sense to women. Sometimes women get confused because they don't understand men how men think, how men function, but men are doing what in their mind does make sense. Uh, Three core needs of people, one need is love, security, and significance, are three of our core needs, love, security, and significance. We all need all three. Men have a Mm -hmm. tendency to have more of a need for significance, whereas women have a tendency to have more of a need for security. That's Mm -hmm. why when you look at men, you find men liking games, things that that are competitive, because through competition, Men establish in, establish significance. Now, the term that men use for that is called respect. I'm not saying respect. It means respect in the between mm-hmm. you're saying, I don't feel mm-hmm. significant. Significance is a key component of, of a man's sense of identity. And so when you look at the mm-hmm. idea of a significance, some men have walked away because somehow they did not feel significant. And you got to understand how that fits. Women have more of a need for security, which is why when you don't feel you can trust somebody, you don't feel like uh, they're going to take care of you, provide, protect the core needs that men try to provide uh, when they don't feel that way, when women feel insecure. When a woman feels insecure, 
to the hard time trusting. But men have a need to feel significant. So sometimes you ask the question, why have someone left? A few things I want to suggest. One is all men are not created equal, of course. So one is that it may be the case because a man at some point didn't feel significant and what might may cause it cause it to happen. Sometimes women don't understand how they're their own worst enemy. Because if you watch the movie uh uh Hancock with, with Will Smith where he was a superhero and there's a woman inside the movie and, and he didn't we initially watching the film, the female, you didn't know she had super strength either, but uh, one night she's arguing with Will Smith. She throws him through the wall and knock and, and, and knocks him through several cars. And later she's going to throw a tanker. But her regular husband comes to the kitchen the next morning, sees the whole wall taken out, and she tells him that Will had did it. And then she reaches up on the shelf and grabs a little jar of jelly. And she acts like she can't open it, and she hands it to him. When she hands it to him, he opens it because for him he needs to feel significant. Your man needs to feel important. And, and sometimes women can be their own worst enemies in this context when, and that's when she provide everything. Honey, would you take care? Would you get my all change in the car? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to it next week. No, I ain't no. If you can't do it now, I'll do it myself. Any job a woman takes on becomes her job. So so when a man is in a relationship with you and you don't need him to do this because you're going to take care of it. I don't need you to do that. I'm going to take care of this. And I, 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 you can't do it when I need it done, when I want it done. I'll do it myself. Well, you'll find yourself doing everything yourself, and then he'll feel like he has no place in your life, no value for you. And so sometimes men walk away because they don't feel significant. They don't feel like they're important. They don't need to feel that they're valued because a strong woman who's too strong would do too many things, and he has no need to be around. He finds something else to do he feels better at because in a relationship, he doesn't feel better. In conjunction with that, in closing, my point, uh, Morty, is that uh, – <laughs> There are three types of people. They're freeloaders, renters, and buyers. And there are some men who just freeloading their mentality. If you've got a man who's a freeloader, that's who he is, and he's not learned how to be more than that. If you've got a man who sees everything as having to be fair, I do my part, you do your part, he's got a risky mentality, and that's the kind of guy that you're dealing with. He's carnal-minded. He's, he's flesh and he's spiritual. A freeloading man is a person who's all animal instinct, First Corinthians 2. Uh, the one who's spiritual minded is seeking to be all of that together. He's seeking to be more spiritual minded and more, more, more directing. So that's the kind of man you got to look for and reach and try to connect with. A man who's seeking to be those things in his life. So a person with a buyer mentality is a person willing to invest in others and look out for you and strengthen you and empower you. So when you say men coming back, you got to assess whether or not he's a, is he, is he a man who has left because he doesn't feel value or significance. Somehow he didn't feel he had the power he should have had in the household and the authority, or is he the kind of guy who doesn't commit to anything? What's his background? All that plays a part in defining what makes a person go one direction or another. I agree, and I think when it comes back to also I would, I would consider is that, you know, again, how a man perceives himself in relationship to God. You know, we can start back in Genesis, and we can look at that dynamic you just described being acted out in real time. Uh, one of the things that uh, I read is one of my favorite stories to continue to read or examples in the Bible is how man responded to his responsibility and how he responded to the woman that was put in his life. And that can be obviously, you know, uh, uh, that same uh, uh, relationship can be extended to others, whether it be children or society. And one of the things that God, uh, I see uh, when Adam first made a bad decision uh, based upon something that was said to him by his wife, he wanted to throw her under the bus, you know, like that woman you gave me told me to do this. And uh, I made, you know, the uh, – uh, I'm expressing this just in general, but God basically was saying, but what did I tell you to do? And I think it begins in the very beginning with even men to this day that one of the problems that we have with leadership and our family and understanding our values is not recognizing and uh, embracing the fact that man was created to to minister and to and to uh, have dominion over all things on the earth, and his role was not one to be lord over others, but to be uh, a servant of God and and, and to uh, uh, nurture those things. And he was given all those things that he needed to do. And the biggest thing that man had been given was the freedom of choice and to decide. And to your point, when we start making our decisions based upon how we feel, I can easily probably imagine um, just on my own that, you know, 
Uh, Adam probably rationalized a whole lot of uh, reasons to not pay attention to his instructions and Eve because obviously with her being his woman, uh, wife, and so forth. But we today we 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 have those examples to look at that uh, again. If we don't understand our value in the relationship, it all comes back to our relationship with God. If we do not understand that, then it doesn't matter all the things that are said and things that happen in between. If we don't start out with the basis of understanding our role and not only uh, in family relationships but our role in service to God, then this is what you get, Um, these types of situations we see today. Life is very complicated. I mean, you know, again, just uh, we're here we are in the 21st century. We have all these other dynamics. Satan got some new tools, very powerful tools. And we still have to adhere to their original instruction, and that is to follow what God has uh, uh, commissioned us to do. Yeah. So I think as you alluded to, the dilemma is that that um, uh, we have drifted away from that. And I think men don't understand sometimes the power that comes to trusting in God, so therefore they try other avenues to find their value. Exactly. And, and, exactly. and when a man has not been raised by a strong man or a man doesn't know what a family structure is or how to be the man in a family, it, it really, I think, creates a situation where some men walk away because they don't really know what their purpose is or their role is or how to be there. Exactly. If you never saw a good man, you don't know how to be a good man. Exactly. Um, so I know it's one of, our, one of our battles that we run with is that area as well. Um, another question we have, Marty, if you want to continue with this one here, uh, is how can a young man, the question is how can a young man be prepared for leadership What's the best age to start preparing him, and how do you teach him to be godly? Are there specific areas to start him off? How would you begin to respond to that? Well, I think that, uh, and this is just, again, uh, something I've come to uh, uh, observe and learn, that everybody's not a leader. Uh, You mentioned that earlier, and I think even the Bible speaks about the various uh, roles and gifts that individuals have, some being teachers, some being preachers, others being uh, servants in various capacities. I think when you think about leadership, uh, that's something that where a person has to understand what their purpose uh, is, and that has to come through their own first uh, desire to know, prayer, and then obviously being uh, uh, brought up in such a way where they're exposed to those uh, options uh, as far as uh, a man of God's role in his, in his uh, kingdom. I think it's very important for us to kind of accept that because it's not unusual for a lot of people to feel that they're not comfortable in certain roles. Uh, I mentioned about where I found my, uh, as a, a little kid, I grew up, I, I, I thought my, my destiny, I, I, I wanted, I love theology, I love God, I love religion, I'm unapologetic about it, and I thought I wanted to grow up to be a preacher. That's what I thought. And as I did go through it, and I even had experience in the pulpit, I began to really realize that maybe where my gift and my ability to lie was not necessarily in the pulpit, but actually out there in the congregation. So, but that started very early to be specific. It started out with a personal desire and recognizing, as he told Jeremiah, he was purpose, but he had to come to understand that we're all purpose before we even come here. And I think it starts with that. And whether you get that at an early age or a middle age or earlier, I think that that's the first thing I must do is understand what is my role in the garden? What is What do I do? Do I plant? Do I water? Do I preach? Do I dig? One of those things that we have to do, and this comes again, uh, starts out with, you know, one's desire. You know, I had to choose to want to follow God. I think that one of the problems that we have with leadership and men wanting to lead is that the avoidance of responsibility. Some people today and for various reasons, are afraid of responsibility. Uh, and just the way that they've learned and been taught, uh, they think that, you know, I don't want to have everybody the soul and blood on my hands if I say the wrong thing, and that's for real and can be problematic. So I think it starts out with the individual who finds themselves in a desire and their willingness to uh, get at the people with experience. Because I'll just say this, there's one thing to have knowledge. In the Bible, there's another thing to have understanding, and then there's wisdom. And so to be a leader, you need all of those things, and whether you start out with knowing what the Word says and then understanding how to apply it, and more importantly, having the wisdom given and empowered by God to be able to carry it out, I give gives you the confidence to be able to become a leader. 
appreciate that, Mark. Let me let me add add with with some conjunction with you you've expressed. For one thing, I would I've done classes at times and in Creed we call the buzz groups. So you have a class, you may break everybody down in groups of three or four. And what you discover you break them down in groups of three or four, that even people who would never say anything have a leadership capacity. And so mm-hmm. I would say that whether it's a child of any age, any person, there is a level. Now they may never lead to the point of leading uh, hundreds of people or thousands of people, but I think everyone has some leadership capacity, and we understand what leadership actually is. The Bible uses mm-hmm. three terms. Just three terms to talk about the idea of those we speak of the term we normally lock onto. It's almost as a title, and not as really a function as the term eldership. But but really, in all honesty, the three terms used in Scripture that relate to this. I like these three terms because I think they give insight to what every leader has. I think the best definition of a leader is understanding the three terms, presbyteros, uh, promeno, and episcopos. Now, that, that word presbyteros is translated presbyter, elder in the King James. Pro, uh, episcopos is translated bishop, overseer. And promeno mm-hmm. is translated as a, as a pastor, shepherd. But these three mm-hmm. terms are three reflections of what every body is supposed to be, not just a certain group of people. These are the qualities and the characteristics of every leader. And when you understand mm-hmm. how they relate to every leader, you will understand what I need to develop inside of a person. What are the qualities and characteristics that they need to be developed? These three terms in Scripture are used, I think, as a, as a picture, a snapshot of understanding the kind of folk who should lead in the congregation, but understand on every level we all to call some form of leadership to somebody, parents leading children, older siblings leading younger siblings, teenagers in the congregation, example of kids who are younger than them. So let me share with you these three terms and how they really relate to the idea of leadership. The term presbyter is interesting because it's translated uh, uh, elder or presbyter, but the, the term, uh, some would say the term initially in its language was used for the stroke to beard, right? It's a term for an older person who's mature. It carries mainly the idea of a person who can set an example worth following. Uh, Aristotle called it ethos, but it's the ability to set an example worth following. The first thing, therefore, any leader, whether it's an older sibling or a child inside your household or, or a person inside the church or even over a country, country rather, the person should, one, if they're going to be a healthy, good leader, they must be willing to set an example worthy of following. You know, at, at any age, your child can learn or others are watching you. You're responsible. You're accountable. I don't have any siblings, but other children are looking at you. Somebody's always watching you. And, it, and the balance is to understand the importance of, of doing the best I can to be the example that I'm supposed to be at every stage, at every level. I'm going to be that to an extent. But as you mature and grow, you should be able to set a better illustration of an example for somebody else. The first term, this term eldership, focused on First Timothy 3 and Titus 1, but it builds with this whole sense of the example that you set. So I would first of all say for any parent who wants a child to be a leader, which means the parent is the leader. As the parent of my kids, my responsibility was to be an example that they can follow. They learn how to talk and how to respond to things, how to act when things go bad. And when you mistreat it, you learn. You set an example worth following, presbyteros. The second term is the term Episcopos, episcopos. Epi is a preposition in the Greek for a lot of on top of. Scopos, scopos, that word, the core of it is scope. We get telescope and microscope, oscilloscope. It's to see or to view. So in episcopos, the word is translated bishop overseer. It has a dual idea to it. Part of the idea is, the, is that when they were building a city, they would first build a long, a tall tower. And someone would stand at the top of the tower to oversee in case danger was coming. So they're trying to build the walls of the city up. But if you don't have anybody looking out for you, you look around, you won't have a wall or a city. So, so the first concept of it was the person who scopes or looks around. Uh, secondly, that term was used by in a military context when, when a general would show up to look at the soldiers. They would all stand, uh, stand up in, 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 uh, uh, in, in, in a salutary position. He would inspect the troops to see uh, if, if they're ready, if they can handle it. He, he inspects them. He watches them. So part of the idea of this is the idea of, of, of being aware of danger, to know whether somebody is ready to perform a task. The second way that word episcopos is used uh, is for the idea of to help a person find their place help them find the spot they fit in. That's what leadership is supposed to do. On one side, leaders are to, are to make sure they're aware of danger, which is why in the Bible a person in leadership on that level uh, uh, has to know the word of God. They can't be a novice because they can't defend the truth. 
So, so the point is then that, that the second style of a leader is somebody who is able to be aware of danger, which means they protect other people and help other people find their place. A good leader, and Aristotle called this uh, a pathos, is the passion to connect with somebody and care for them. So one, a leader as a parent or in any context connects with this baby to my parental uh, Proverbs says to train up a child in the way they should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. But let's take that, that, that verse in its context. The, the term train had, had a dual meaning, right? Train was a word used for when uh, a, a baby was born. You would take your finger, the midwife would take a finger and put inside some jam and would put her finger inside the child's mouth, and the child began to suck. So the word train means to create a taste, to create a taste. The word was also used when you have a wild animal, a wild stallion, and they would embrace his spirit. They would channel his energy. So when the Bible says to train up a child, it means to, 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 um, uh, to, to, uh, to, to channel the energy by creating a taste. Train up a child in the way he should go. We've often taken that verse and say, well, bring him to church. When he gets older, they'll, they'll stay in. That's not what Solomon's saying. Solomon's saying that you've got to learn your child's way. One child may be athletic, one may be more of a reader, one, one more in-house, more out-house. The point is the idea that you train, you create, you channel the energy by creating a taste in the way of that child. You learn your child, and you grow them in that path. You lead them into leadership by understanding their way, and you learn how to lead others that, that uh, be that presbyteros in that context. They learn, they learn how, to, how to set that example, that standard. They learn how to look at others to connect with people, and people learn to follow them because they seem trustworthy. And last but not least, the third term here, Poimeno, Pastor Shepherd deals with the idea of, of how a shepherd loves sheep, right? It was a word that actually you can look at in a sense was called the sheepfold. And when shepherds were not shepherding throughout the, throughout the week with their, their sheep, they were responsible, accountable for at night. They would put this rectangular or square formed of rocks up together for a sheep fold. And at the, at the end of the night, as it got dark in the night, uh, each, each shepherd would, would call his sheep forward. He would run his hands all over the, the lamb's body to make sure there's no briars, there's no sticks, there's no ticks or something on them. So he's safe for the course of the night. And then once all the shepherds had checked their lambs out and put them inside of a sheep fold, one would sleep across the doorway to protect them throughout the course of the night because a shepherd loves and cares for, seeks to understand and to bond with sheep. In other words, for a child or anybody to be a good leader, first of all, they got to understand the value of setting the example. Secondarily, they must be willing to connect with somebody to see their benefit and the value in others to build someone else up. So first of all, you model that by pouring that into your child before your child can pour that into someone else. And thirdly, they learn how to care when someone's hurting. You don't, you don't let them have the attitude where they're better than someone else so they can look down upon others. They have to have a heart of a shepherd where they understand others are mis, misguided sometimes and misaligned, and they have to have that softness to see the benefit. A man has to be velvet and steel to be the man he needs to be. I think leadership is something we can all learn on some level. We all should seek to be a leader. We are leading others to Christ, after all, but it begins with an example secondary with the relationship, and thirdly, when my example is not enough and my relationship is not enough, I need to be able to intellectually explain what I'm doing to help it make sense for somebody to follow my lead. I think to kind of piggyback on what you said, I, I wholly understand. I, I agree with that. I think uh, there's some sub-points to that, too, that you kind of alluded to, and one of them is, is that uh, we, give, we start out, we give instructions, uh, and that's takes on various levels. I often use uh, uh, the example of what I call now, uh, which will be the title of my next book, uh, Perspective from 70,000 Feet, okay, which means I'm 70 mm -hmm. years old. When I look back uh, from the time when I was a child uh, and I looked at how I learned the process of finding myself and, to your point, of finding out where, you know, my leadership or what my role might be in. We know there are all types of levels of leadership. You alluded to the uh, military, for example. We have to look at that and see how there's, uh, you know, uh, ranks that go about. Each one of them has a specific duty. Uh, some people uh, become master sergeant. That's as far as they want to ascend. Uh, maybe it's as far as their abilities let them do. You have corporals. You have sergeants. 
then you have lieutenants and so forth all the way up to generals. And I think that if you use that and kind of kind of use that as a model for what we do in life, every stage of our life, we learn a little something about ourselves. And I think when you're in a parent or a, a leader in the Lord's Word, you allow, I use the example of a sort of like a flower pot. Uh, you have, you plant and you give a, a, a water and seed, but a flower pot is always uh, expanding. You know, you start out with, with, it has parameters in which to control that in lower environment, but as that pot grows, you keep uh, replanting it into a larger pot, which is uh, to allow it to grow. And the purpose behind that is to allow an individual, I often learn in my uh uh, not only just only in my studies in psychology, but I also uh, just as a parent that, uh, you know, there's one thing to instruct and there's another thing to nurture, okay? Uh, you know, we talk about um, how, you know, a shepherd is with his sheep uh, and he had the hook, and the hook was not the beating with, but to pull him back into the fold when he got too far away. This is all part of the training a person and, or allowing a person to be able to find their role uh, as they mature and, and to what level that leadership will come. And I think it's very important for us as Christians and as just fathers and as men to learn to uh, 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 nurture and to, like you said, pay attention to our children because each one will have different talents. And if I want you, you hear stories over and over of people living their life according to what somebody else thinks they should do. And we have Bible examples of people who led uh, God's people up to a certain point, and uh, when they couldn't move forward any further, there was someone to step up. We see that all the way from Moses all the way, the people who uh, led to the best of their ability, and then when it was time for someone to take the reins, they did. And I think that's a lesson for us when we're trying to bring our young men up is to be able to have someone with experience and wisdom. Paul took in Timothy that way and taught him that he needed to study but he also gave him parameters and gave him a chance to, uh, uh, you know, I won't say just make mistakes, but to experience things and with some good guidance, that's how to uh, find your place in leadership. That's what I believe. Let me, let me add to that, that, Marty. Like you said, but Paul trained Timothy and Barnabas trained Paul. So everyone has to have somebody mm-hmm. who leads exactly. and develops them in that context. And let me just add, mothers have to be very careful with their sons. Because most mothers are harder on their daughters than they are on their sons, and most men are harder on their sons than on their daughters. It's a natural dynamic that should happen. But mothers have to be very careful and very cautious that they don't baby their sons, let the sons become men, which means that they got to learn sometimes the hard way. they got to hurt sometimes and have the struggles because that's a part of growing and maturing in life. One more thing I want to add about men in leadership. Sometimes women feel that men aren't leading. He just won't take leadership. I, I'm asking to lead. The man won't lead. Let me share something with you. Men are always leading. They're always leading. But he ain't leading. No, he is leading. He's leading. The thing is that men are always leading. He makes leadership decisions, and he chooses a course. So you may say, well, won't you lead us and go to lead us to church? You know, he made a leadership decision. I'm not going to do it. So it's not mm-hmm. that men don't lead. They're always natural. It is inherently inside of man's nature to lead. That's why he won't follow path of direction at times. But the point is that he may not be leading in a healthy way. He might be leading. He may not be leading the family in a way that's good for the family. He may not be making leadership decisions that are blessing for everybody. It's not that he's not leading. It's that he's not leading in the way that may be the best way to lead or the way that you would want him to lead. But men don't think like women, and it's important to understand the, the keys to a wise woman understands how to back up and let a man become the man he needs to be, and that requires her being willing to 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 allow him to take the steps. He may not. The men that you see are very responsible and very accountable right now, and manage their business at home and take care of things. They do that because they felt they had to. If she had all the answers and did all the work and took everything, he'd sit back and do nothing. But the woman he was with either did not know or knew better than to take over. So before you know it, that he had he had to learn to be a leader. He had to learn the responsibility of taking over because he realized if he had not done that, things would fall apart. So all I'm advocating is that 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 understand that men are taking leadership decisions, and you have to learn how to work with a man, uh, but and, and not give commands to men. Sometimes men just shut down because they feel they're not being understood. Or, or worked with. But then, first of all, it, Marty alluded to a book, uh, one of the books, my wife, my wife, written several, but one of the books I wrote, uh, 
well, don't get stuck with the food, how to navigate it with my healthy relationships. And we talk about <laughs> just the danger of, of, of when you're looking at getting in a relationship with somebody, it's really key that you understand not the person, not just the person you're dealing with, You've got to understand yourself. If something's missing inside of you, you're going to grab somebody and make yourself feel better, and they'll mess your life up. So all I'm advocating is that we talk about men and talk about these relationships and the centrality of being the, being or what does a man really need. Men need to spend time with other men doing healthy things. Every guy is not good for you, but when a man is trying to be strong and he's connecting with the right kind of men, he'll be empowered, he'll be strengthened, and your son being around, Men, healthy men, uh, find those mentors. You know, the uh, the Bible talks about a woman who went to to a, a judge and asked him to to hear her case, and and, and because this judge says, I'm, "I'm tired of you coming to me. You keep asking for help. I'm going to help." I would declare this: Don't ever stop asking for help. You ask one person, "Would you talk to my son? Would you would you would you mentor him some?" And that person won't do it. Don't stop. Find somebody else. Never get to the place. I asked two people. Nobody helped me, so I just let it go. Don't let it go. Your son, <laughs> your son does need to connect with a spiritual, strong-minded man. You keep pushing, you keep pressing. Be an irritant. Be a frustration. So be it. But whatever it is, you know you got a need. Get your need that your child is important. So you keep asking, you keep pushing until you find the person with the right heart and the right willingness and the right skill set to help your son be the best he can be. And not just your son. Your daughters also need to connect with a healthy man because a girl finds – her sense of identity and the relationship she has initially with her father, with the mold of, of the father. The job of a father is to validate his daughter's femininity. What does that mean, preacher? Well, that really means that let your daughter, your daughter, uh, uh, she, uh, there's a thin line between the healthy validation of a father and a guy that says, you keep us be dancing in the pole. There's a very thin line between that. But when a father validates his daughter, which basically says he lets her know I love you and I care, I love you, you're important, you're beautiful, you're special, just because you're mine. When she is a man who tells her that from her early life and treats her that way as a queen for her life, then when she gets older, she will get to a place, the first guy said, you look cute. Well, I've been getting it all my life. A man has always told me that. Now what else you got to say? But when a girl has not gotten that healthy male validation early inside her life, this is what happens when she gets older, and she gets older, and she needs that, feels a need for validation. The first guy tells her she's cute blows her mind because it's the first time a man has acknowledged her value. The problem is that he's not acknowledging because he cares about her. He's acknowledging because he wants something from her. And if you don't know the distinction between those two barriers, then it confuses the female's mind, and she jumps involved with somebody who's not good for her. You know what? I know we're getting near the end of time, and I just want to sum up one thing uh, you mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, uh, uh, women not uh, babying their sons, or their. Uh, you mentioned something about them being uh, uh, harder on their uh, uh, daughters than they were the sons. Well, uh, Betty Goins didn't get the memo, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, she didn't get the memo, bro. Because I would tell you, growing up with my brother, uh, older and sister, uh, being younger than me. Uh, my mother, uh, and to your point you just made, and I, I started out by saying this uh, because the premise was like well, about single mothers and how men become men. My mother grew up, uh, you know, the men in her life, and they were a lot older than her. Uh, my mother, so they were stretched out. She had grown brothers and sisters when she was a kid. But all of them, uh, the men, including my grandfather, had already did those things, set those examples, and instilled upon my mom to the point where she knew what a man's role should look like. She demanded nothing less of that of my brother. My brother was there to make sure I understood, and I learned that all the way up until his passing, uh, to that of uh, the role of a man. But it came from the idea, uh, once again, that understanding our value as a man in the family and knowing that, again, I don't have to lord over uh, my mm-hmm. family, my daughters, my mother, or sisters, or, but what I have to do is accept the role given to me by God, ordained, as, as your point, a leader of a family. And what am I leading them to? I'm leading them in the way of the Lord so that in that day when we uh, see the Lord again, I hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. 
I really appreciate everything that you share with me, Brother Hubbard. I'm always enlightened to uh, uh, listening to you and to other people, and uh, I hope that the things that we share today that those listening in can understand that this is a discussion between two brothers who love to study. And so <laughs> I love it. Love it, I love it, I love it. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, I appreciate the insight uh, you gave me about uh, 15 words. You know I'm going to go look up and study. <laughs> but uh, that's because um, I really believe this, and I'll say this in some way. I hear people and uh, men all the time, they talk about, you know, uh, being a Christian, and they're like, oh, I don't believe in hell, and I don't believe in these different things. And, but, and you know what I just respond like this? You know, I grew up hearing all the sermons about hell and brimstone, and I heard some of those. But I never really pay. I didn't study hell. Like, I don't study going into prison or some of those things. What I studied was the promise of um, the uh, life that was given to me in eternity and the option. And I've learned through other programs that when you choose, when you choose, to follow God, when you choose morality, it's much more powerful than when you uh, do anything out of fear. And one of the things I think that if we as men uh, with our daughters and our sons instilling them a sense of value, and that value is based upon what God has given to us and not upon the world, then I think in the end result is be that we'll have men, will be good leaders, and daughters will know how to pick the man, to your point, because they'll have examples in their life. Thanks for letting me share with you today. <laughs> Bless you, Marty. I appreciate that. Let me just say add one more little piece, too, and that is that one of our dilemmas is that I think, as you alluded to, Marty, parents have changed so much over the years, and the generation now has sometimes not practiced the same principle that you were raised with, maybe I was raised with as well. And I think because mm-hmm. of that, we have to remind people of the dynamics of how we function, how you have to learn to operate today, because what, what came natural Years ago, it does not come natural now. Things have changed so much. But, uh, again, as you alluded to, we appreciate uh, Kelly. Thank you so much for the invitation for us to share with you. I pray that this has been an insightful opportunity for those who tuned in and had a chance to hear our dialogue. And uh, we pray that uh, each one may contemplate how they can best uh, be that insight for their children and for themselves and valuing the fellowship that God has put inside of his body. May God hold you in his hand and bless your efforts. Be blessed. Have eternal now and day. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Brother Hubbard, Brother Goins, I thank you both so much for this information. Um, it was insightful. Um, and and my prayer is that those who are in our listening audience, um, it was good information for them. I know this was a conversation by me and for men, um, but I'm I'm sure it was just as uh, inspiring to uh, the sisters and the women that we have in our audience today. So once again, um, it was really good information, and I just pray that someone was inspired by it. Um, there will be a recording uh, of this of this uh, discussion, and I will make sure that I share it um, with both you, Brother Hubbard, and Brother Goins. I'll share it also on my Facebook page. And then anyone that has my number, if you want me to send you a copy of this recording, uh, just send me a text, and I'll be happy to do so. Um, I also want to thank Brother Stevie for allowing us to to have this platform so that this type of information can be shared uh, locally throughout the country and from what Brother Stevie shared, even outside the country. So, which, which is a blessing. It's a blessing. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you, everyone, for your presence tonight. Um, have a great evening, and I will now turn it over to Brother Stevie. You are listening to What a Word from the Lord Radio Show. And if you miss me from singing, sing it. and you can't find me nowhere. nowhere. Come on up to glory. glory. I'll be singing the fair. Yes, I will. And I know the Lord. He will greet me over yonder. Over on the other shore. Nowhere. 
glory. I'll be praising the best. Her minister say to see all day long. The glory. glory, I'll be singing the best. Yes, I will, and uh, I, I know the Lord. He will bring me. Listening to What a Word from the Lord Radio Show.